Chapter 11 continued. Catherine's feelings as she got into the carriage were in a very unsettled state, divided between regret for the loss of one great pleasure and the hope of soon enjoying another, almost its equal in degree, however unlike in kind. She could not think the Tilneys had acted quite well by her, and so readily giving up their engagement without sending her any message of excuse. It was now but an hour later than the time fixed on for the beginning of their walk, and in spite of what she had heard of the prodigious accum accumulation of dirt in the course of that hour, she could not have gone. She could not, from her own observation, help thinking that they might have gone with very little inconvenience. To feel herself slighted by them was very painful. On the other hand, the delight of exploring an edifice like Udolpho, as her fancy represented Blaise Castle to be, was such a counterpoise of good as might console her for almost anything. They passed briskly down Pulteney Street and through Lower Place without the exchange of many words. Thorpe talked to his horse, and she meditated by turns on broken promises and broken arches and phaetons and false hangings, tilneys and trapdoors. As they entered Argyle Buildings, however, she was roused by this address from her companion. Who's that girl who looked at you so hard as she went by? Who? Where? On the right-hand pavement, she must be almost out of sight now. Catherine looked round and saw Miss Tilney leaning on her brother's arm, walking slowly down the street. She saw them both in looking back at her. Stop, stop, Mr. Thorpe, she impatiently cried. It is Miss Tilney, it is indeed. How could you tell me they were gone? Stop, stop, I will get out this moment and go to them. But to what purpose did she speak? Thorpe only lashed his horse into a brisker trot. The Tilneys, who had soon ceased to look after her, were in a moment out of sight round the corner of Lower Place, and in another moment she was herself whisked into the marketplace. Still, however, and during the length of another street, she entreated him to stop. Pray, pray, stop, Mr. Thorpe. I cannot go on. I will not go on. I must go back to Miss Tilney. But Mr. Thorpe only laughed, smacked his whip, encouraged his horse, made all noises, and drove on. And Catherine, angry and vexed as she was, having no power of getting away, was obliged to give up to the point and submit. Her report, report, her reproaches, report, her report, reproaches, however, were not spared. How could you deceive me so, Mr. Thorpe? How could you not, how could you say that you saw them driving up the Lansdowne Road? I would not have had it happen so for the world. They must think it so strange. So rude of me to go by them, too, without saying a word. You do not know how vexed I am. I shall have no pleasure at Clifton, nor in anything else. I had rather, ten thousand times rather, get out now and walk back to them. How could you say you saw them driving out in a phaeton? Thorpe defended himself very stoutly, declared. He had never seen two men so much alike in his life. I would hardly give up the point of its having been Tilney himself. Their drive, even when the subject was over, was not likely to be very agreeable. Catherine's complacence was no longer what it had been in their former rearing. She listened reluctantly, and her replies were short. Blaise Castle remained her only comfort. Towards that, she still looked at intervals with pleasure, though rather than be disappointed of the promised walk, and especially rather than be thought ill of by the Tilneys, she would willingly have given up all the happiness which its walls could supply, the happiness of a progress through long suites of lofty rooms exhibiting the remains of magnificent furniture, though now for many is deserted, happiness of being stopped in the way through along narrow winding vaults by a little grated door, or even of having their lamp, their only lamp, extinguished by a sudden gust of wind, and of being left in total darkness. In the meanwhile, they proceeded on their journey without any mischance, and were within view of the town of 
Kinsham, when a halloo from Moorland, who was behind them, made his friend pull up to know what was the matter. The others then came close enough for conversation, and Moorland said, We had better go back, Thorpe. It is too late to go on today. Your sister thinks so as well as I. We have been exactly an hour coming from Pulteney Street, very little more than seven miles, and I suppose we have at least eight more to go. It will never do. We set out a great deal too late. We had much better put it off till another day and turn around. It is all one to me, replied Thorpe rather angrily, and instantly turning his horse, they were on their way back to Bath. If your brother had not got such a dem beast to drive, said he soon afterwards, we might have done it very well. My horse should have clotted, trotted to Clifton within the hour, if left to himself, and I have almost broke my arm with pulling him in that cursed, broken-winded jade's place. Morland is a fool for not keeping a horse and gig of his own. No, he is not said Catherine warmly, for I am sure he could not afford it. Why cannot he afford it? Because he has not money enough. And whose fault is that? Nobody's that I know of. Thorpe then said something in the loud, incoherent way to which he had often recourse about its being a damn thing to be miserly, and that if people who rolled in money could not afford things, he did not know who could, which Catherine did not even endeavor to understand. Disappointed, of what was to have been the consolation for her first disappointment, she was less and less disposed either to be agreeable herself or to find her companion so, and they returned to Pulteney Street without her speaking twenty words. As she entered the house, the footman told her that a gentleman and lady had called, inquired for her a few minutes after her setting off, that when she when he told them she was gone out with Mr. Thorpe, the lady had asked whether any message had been left for her, and on his saying no, had felt for a card, but said she had none about her, and went away. Pondering over these heart-rending tidings, Catherine walked slowly upstairs. At the head of them she was met by Mr. Rallin, who, on hearing the reason of their speedy return, said, I am glad your brother had so much sense I am glad you are come back. It was a strange, wild scheme. They all spent the evening together at Thorpe's. Catherine was disturbed, disturbed and out of spirits, but Isabella seemed to find a pool of commerce in the fate of what she shared by a par private partnership with Morland, a very good equivalent for the quiet and country air of an inn at Clifton. Her satisfaction, too, in not being at the lower rooms was spoken more than once. How I pity the poor creatures that are going there. How glad I am that I am not amongst them. I wonder whether it will be a full ball or not. They have not begun dancing yet. I would not have been, I would not be there for all the world. It is so delightful to have an evening now and then to oneself. I dare say it will not be a very good ball. I know the Mitchells will not be there. I am sure I pity everybody that is. But I dare say, Mr. Morland, you long to be at it, do not do not you? I am sure you do. Well, pray, do not let anybody here be a restraint on you. I dare say we could do very well without you. But you men think yourselves of such consequence. Catherine could almost have accused Isabella of being wanting in tenderness towards herself and her sorrows. So very little did they appear to dwell on her mind, and so very inadequate was the comfort she offered. Do not be so dull, my dearest creature, she whispered. You will quite break my heart. It was amazingly shocking, to be sure, but the Tilneys were entirely to blame. Why were they not more punctual? It was dirty indeed, but what did that signify? I am sure John and I should not have minded it. I never mind going through anything where a friend is concerned. That is my disposition, and John is just the same. He has amazing strong feelings. Good heavens, what a delightful hand you have got. Kings, I vow, I never was so happy in my life. I would fifty times rather you should have them than myself. And now I may dismiss my heroine to the sleepless couch, which is the true heroine's portion, to a pillow strewed with thorns and wet with tears. 
and lucky may she think herself if she get another good night's rest in the course of the next three months.